Okay, cool. So, Mike Hideous, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. My pleasure, Greg. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to um, uh, just right off the bat, I'm obviously not a, uh, a professional, um, a noob to this kind of thing. So uh, kind of like the title would suggest, I, I, I feel like the interviews that I always thought were the most interesting and, you know, uh, fun to watch are kind of the ones where it's two people more or less just having a conversation as opposed to, you know, being like, so, so tell me about this or, you know, what does this mean? You know, and there's a couple of those questions that uh, just being a fan, I'm a little bit curious of, but uh, sure. it's, uh, I like to have it be a relaxed atmosphere. Okay. So want to uh, plug the book, obviously I'll put in the description, everything to mikehideous.com. Um, that's kind of the first question I want to ask you is, um, you know, what made you want to do a uh, another edition of uh, of the book? That's a good hold. Hold that thought right there. Hold yeah. That. So um, I have here the actual um, edited, pre-printed, edited version of the book. So that's oh, the cover of the book now. This is just a, a version that I had. Um, it, yeah, there you go. Um, as you can see, I, I have all the little things here. I was the printer gave this to me, and, and basically I I go through it, and um, I was checking areas that needed to be corrected. So, um, your question was, what inspired me to do the third version? Right? Is that what you're yeah. asking? All right. Yes, sir. When I initially wanted to do um, a book. I was in the Misfits at the time in, in 1998. I, I remember we um, we were going to the South American tour. I had already done the European tour and we were literally in Brazil. And I had the idea that I wanted to um, do a book uh, writing about what it was like to go from who I was as Mike Hideous in the Empire Hideous and then jump into a pre-established legendary punk rock band from as far back as the 70s now i had known jerry and doyle uh i met them in 1980 i think it was 87 and so anyway but not to get too far off track here i had yeah. known them i uh, for 11 years i end up getting the getting in the band and I wanted to write what it was like to become a rock star. Yeah. So initially, the, the whole premise of the book was going to be about the misfits and my position having gotten into the band. So, uh, again, fast forward. I end up getting kicked out of the band. So I decided, you know what? I'm still going to write the book. But instead of writing it solely about the misfits, I'm going to write it about my history, my whole back history as a musician, how I started and how I got into the misfits. Plus, I wanted to tell my side of the story as to why I got kicked out after knowing them for 11 years, all the things that I, I helped them, or I should say, helped Jerry do. Uh, which ended up he ended up you know suing Glenn Danzig and all that shit. Uh, as you as you read in the book, you read it yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So there 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 is a you know once once I I go through the first I believe it is the first eight chapters of how my life started as a musician and knowing them. As a matter of fact, I met Jerry before. I even started Empire Hideous. So I, I already had them as, as friends. I did work for them. I did paintings for them. I did uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Like uh, stuff for, like for Christ to Conquer and stuff I remember. Reading. Right. That's right. And and as crappy as that band was, Christ the Conqueror, what, what, what a flop. I mean, as crappy as it was, my... My... Adam, ad, uh, ad, uh, admiration yeah that and my adoring 
uh, feelings for, for Jerry. He was an influence to me. Both him and Danzig were influences to me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, after all that time, when I got kicked out of the band, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to continue to write the book. But instead of just focusing on the misfits, I'm going to write about my whole career. And that's what I did. So in 2000, it came out technically in November of 2002. I started writing it in 1998, the summer of 1998. It took one whole year to write it, one whole year to do the editing. I had a guy by the name of Chris Ewell, who I used to work with at a magazine. He did the editing for me. So it took a whole year to do all the corrections, the edits, you know, put stuff in, take stuff out. Then the layout, another about a half a year for the layout, pictures, organizing everything, so on and so forth. And then finally, about six months to a year to um, to find somebody that would be interested in publishing it. So the book comes out in 2000, technically 2002, but a lot of people say early 2003. And uh, when I looked back, you know, like a year or two later, I re- reread my own book. Right. And I, I said to myself, you know, this this is shit. I, I, I'll tell you why. Even though I was writing as a journalist at that time right. for other uh, for a music magazine, as well as other music magazines. I wasn't that good. I'll be the first to admit I wasn't that good. I got better as time went on, uh, but I didn't like I looked back at that book and I'm like, wow, this could be a lot better. So I rewrote it in 2014. I made the conscious decision to rewrite the book. Not let me rephrase that, not rewrite it, but re-edit the whole thing. So the second version that was printed in 2016, that's when it came out. I started in 2014, had a lot of problems trying to find somebody that would print a a uh, do a print on demand and distribute it. So yeah. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it on my own. And that's exactly what I did. I went to a printer and had the book printed on my own. So that was a second version. However, I was in such a rush to get the second version out that I ended up giving the printer a version that was not uh, correct with the edits. In other words, uh, by the time the, the second pressing got printed, I read it and I was like, oh, my God, typographical errors, skips in, in, in sections, double paragraphs. And I was like, oh, man. So I, I, I was really upset because I was really hoping that that book would be the last one I would do. Mm-hmm. So, again, time went by. And I believe it was uh, last winter. When I decided, I actually asked a bunch of Hideous fans on the uh, the Hideous Mike Facebook page. I asked them, I said, listen, if I redo the book, would, would people be interested in buying it? And people responded in a positive way. So I said, OK, I'll redo it. So I decided, all right, well, I might as well make this one a limited edition as well. So change the cover, change the front cover. Uh... I changed a lot of the pictures inside, took some out, added some new ones. Um, I re re-edited again the whole book, went through it page by page. Um, and that's pretty much how I got to where the third version came out. Nice. Because I was, um, was, you know, reading it and uh, kind of going through it, there was... Uh, a fair amount that I was familiar with, of course, just because I've followed you from it for a number of years. Um, but I, I, one of the things that uh, I had I'd noticed is there, it does seem to be a lot more, um, I guess, cohesive. And I feel like there's like more, almost more of a cohesive story to the book now versus the, I guess, the the previous pressing. So which one are you talking about? The first pressing or the second pressing? Um, I guess the one that I would have had was, I guess the first pressing because it was pretty pretty old paperback. Um, was I was was I on the cover without a shirt, sitting down? Do, yes. do you remember? Yeah, that that's the first one. 
That's okay. the first one. And, and and as you were saying, it's a little bit more cohesive because, well, I mean, let's just face it. I mean, the, the writing wasn't as good. I, I, the, the entire first, in fact, the whole book was taken from the journals that I kept, mm-hmm. uh, not only with the misfits, but my own personal journals to, yeah. you know, I, I researched everything. You know, if anybody ever doubts what I say in those books, it can't be disputed because the, inf- pardon me, the information that I wrote in that book is directly from the notes and, and, the, and the journal that I kept mm. throughout my years as a, a, from as far back as when I was 18 up until I got, uh, you know, into a band and eventually into the Misfits. When I went on the first European tour with the Misfits, I, I wrote an entire book. I brought a book with me about, about that thick and about that big. And every day I would write in it. And I think I, I filled about 100, maybe 250 pages worth. That was, yeah, that every day. I was writing in that book every day. And then by the time I got home to, re, to write the whole book itself in 98, um, at that point, all I did was research day after day. And I mean, looking through the journal, looking through flyers, looking through um, articles and interviews that I did uh, with the band, looking at, uh, golly, um, you know, just everything that I could find to prove that what I was writing about was accurate. Yeah. And I mean, I'm talking down to the day, you know, the date, the time, the location, who was around me, so on and so forth. And do you know what was what influenced me to write a book? There was a a guy by the name of Marilyn Manson. Maybe you heard of him. Of course. He wrote a book. He wrote a book. I think it was called uh, It's a Hard Road. Long Road Out of Hell. Long Road Out of Hell, yeah. I read that book. I think it was 1997 when it Mm -hmm. came out, around that time. Maybe 96. Right? I think you're right. Definitely like nine. It's 96 to 98. It was definitely before yeah. 99. I know that. Yeah, I know. I know it wasn't 98 because that was the year I got with the missing. Oh yeah, right. That was it. As a matter of fact, I was at the book signing. Uh, at the time, it was a place called Tower Records and Video, uh, in New York City, uh, and he did his book signing, and I remember seeing him and waving to him because you know they had all all kinds of security guards around because like he was a marked man people want to kill him yeah he was a a big deal for all all of the reasons right and wrong right right (laughs) and at that point he he had to have like armed guards around him because people wanted to kill him you know they, they they seriously thought he was the antichrist and he was too over the top for a lot of people um, but he's an intelligent man and he knew what he was doing. Point is, I read his book. I was so in, inspired by the fact that here's a music. Now, he didn't write the book. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a ghostwriter, the guy who actually wrote the book, whose name escapes me. But he was the guy who wrote for a magazine called Alternative Press. And in okay, fact, yeah. in fact, even wrote a negative review, review about Empire Hideous in the <laughs> magazine. But I, I immediately recognized his name when I saw it in the book. Long story short, I read the book. I was inspired by it. I'm like, this is what I need to do. Yeah. It, you know, it took a couple of years, but I said, this is what I want to do. Um, and that's what I did. Yeah. The Manson's book is uh, funny enough that it, it is a good read. I remember, um, I remember picking it up a while ago. Um, and it's it's interesting that that influenced you to, to write your memoirs. Um, I read a lot of memoirs. It's kind of uh, I get my my wife gives me a little bit of shit because it's mostly most of the books that I have are like are, are memoirs of musicians. You know, like the another good one was uh, like Tony Iommi has Iron Man, and um, but this was one I was uh, I was telling her a little bit about, and she's not not as familiar with 
with a lot of the the more i guess underground and <clears throat> kind of like gothic type stuff that that I, I i enjoy introduced her to it a little bit but uh she was curious when i was reading the book and kind of telling her stories uh, some of the more uh unfortunate stories that are are, are in the book um in, in my book in, in yeah. my book oh okay yeah you know so um just kind of balancing some ideas off of her one of the things that you had touched on a little bit that i, I did want to um kind of ask you about is in the in the, like the early empire hideous days you were originally playing guitar and singing correct a little bit um because in the in the very early days of Empire Hideous, I had two guitar players. When that fell apart, I went through a number of uh, band lineup mem- ba- members of the of the lineup, and I, I yeah, oh, it was just terrible, just terrible. I couldn't get a steady lineup, and and so for the second incarnation, and even the third incarnation. I didn't have a secondary guitar player. Mm-hmm. So what I would do is I had to learn how to, I mean, I knew how to play guitar, but not good. So from 1990, yeah, from uh, maybe 91, from about 91 until about 93, I was playing guitar, uh, at least the parts that I could play and sing at the same time. Because it's not easy. I, I mean, you play guitar. It's not exactly easy to play and sing at the same time. Anyway, the point is, um, uh, I, I played guitar only to give it that extra oomph that that yeah. Empire Hideous needed. But it was not not my forte, and I really I wanted to find another guitar player. And it took about almost oh, it took about three years, about three years going on four. To, to find to find Jeff Austin, who eventually ended up coming into the band. Yeah, there was um, another uh, question. That's kind of uh, early, those early influences. It's I mean you've talked about it before, but it's it's fairly it's fairly obvious that I think like the early influence were bands like Fields of the Nephilim and Sisters of Mercy and The Mission. Um, there was always a sound, but I feel like the guitar sound that I feel like Empire Hideous kind of became known for really kind of started when Jeff Austin joined. Would you say that's oh, fair? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. When Jeff came into the band, uh, his influences were bands like, like you just mentioned, Sisters of Mercy, the Chameleons UK, the Mission UK, uh, Fields, Fields of the Nephilim on top. Fields of the Nephilim and, and, and Chameleons were right on top. Um, uh, you know, there are other bands too. Like we were into like bands like the Gun Club. Um, oh yeah, great band. Uh, you know, it, it's a shame that uh, the lead singer ended up dying. I can't remember his name. I was um, just say, what was his name? I know Mark uh, Lanigan was a, a, a huge fan of the Gun Club, and, and he was another great singer. Um, damn it. And he, to, yeah, all, and the, the thing is, uh, I, I mean, once we got Jeff in, Jeff was a disciplined uh, musician. And by that, I mean, he was dedicated to his instrument. He was, I mean, he practiced all the time. This is a guy who had like no social life. You know, he just basically <laughs> sat home and played guitar. At the same time, he was also working down in uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, as an engineer for a radio um, a radio station, so he knew his way around electronics in the music industry. That's good. Uh, he, he absolutely, yeah. Uh, in addition, he was a, a former uh, uh, veteran from the army uh, oh, who sure. served. Yeah, he served four years in the army. Um, so, as I said, Jeff was a a disciplined. Uh, respectful respected man um and also he had a punk rock background and most of the people that i ever i had ever worked with with empire it is a few that weren't but most of them were punk rock background having grown up with that element in their in their lifestyle so that helped a lot because 
you want to get, at least for me, with, with Empire Hideous, I wanted somebody that had the punk attitude, the punk style, but was still able to have a more polished, professional sound mm-hmm. and know their way around an <clears throat> instrument without just playing three chords. Right. So Jeff fit that mold perfectly. And uh, him and I got off to a great start. Uh, in about one year, about a year and maybe a year and a half, give or take. Actually, no, just about over a year, because I met Jeff at the very end of 1993, and we were ready to take him on into the band. But I, st- like, he literally joined, and I had like a gig in a month, but I wasn't gonna let him play it because I, I, that's how I was. I was always very cautious. Wanted to make sure that they were, were well rehearsed and knew the, the, the band. I mean, this was no joke for me. This was, I was ready to take Empire Hideous to the, the top level. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, after a year, after a year of Jeff playing gigs with us in 1994, uh, at the time, my wife and I, we decided we were going to rent a house in which we could have enough rooms for the other musicians to live and have a finished basement in which we could rehearse. And eventually Jeff moved in with us. Um, At the time, my bass player Eve, she moved in with us. Uh, At the time we had a drummer, uh, this guy, Joey Quest. He moved in in the basement. Jeff moved in, I don't know if I said that. Uh, Jeff moved in and eventually when Joey, Joey, our drummer moved out, Mars, the second guitar player, he moved in. So we and it's cool, we have such great place too. Uh, unfortunately, we ended up getting kicked out after about two years because the landlord, <clears throat> the landlord was going to sell the house. Really a, a shame because it, it was such a great house. I lived on the uh, the top floor at the time when I was married, um, so I had the whole top floor to myself. And then Eve had her own room. Jeff had his own room. Mars had his own room. We had a rehearsal space. We had one, two, three showers. We had four bathrooms. We had uh, Three kitchens. I I mean, it was great. We had a five-car driveway. We had a garage. We had a backyard. We had a porch. This fucking place was awesome. And and I'll tell you, it was fantastic. I loved living there. Unfortunately, we ended up having to move move out sooner than we expected. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of that. And then things kind of got complicated. But I forget what the fuck your question was. (laughs) (laughs) What was your question? Um, the early Empire Hideous days and, and the uh, Me playing guitar. early influences and, and yeah, you playing guitar and then eventually Jeff coming in and, and kind of further developing the sound that you guys kind yes. of ended up. I feel like the sound got more consistent as you it guys sure got did. like, like post 94, it's, it seemed a lot more consistent, rough. you know, it, it was rough before 94. Um, a little bit. When she- yeah, definitely. I mean, how do I say this respectfully? Mars was, and I say this with respect, I, I, I'm not throwing out any hate towards him, but Mars wasn't a polished guitar player like Jeff was. Jeff was sincere in what he did and how he, 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 he approached it. I mean, he spent a lot of money on equipment. He learned the equipment. He knew it inside and out. He used to read that manual. He knew he knew what the fuck ohms were and amps and watts. Like, I didn't know any of that shit myself. But he knew it all. And, you know, Mars, again, nothing, not taking anything away from Mars, but he wasn't as polished as Jeff was. So when Jeff come, comes in, he brings this big sound with two amps, like PV amps with, with uh, what the hell did he have? Um, oh, shit. I can't remember the head he had, a uh, real great head, and then he like moved up to like a line six. He knew his stuff. Yeah. Uh, so by getting him in the band, eventually, like I, I would sit down with him a lot, especially because we were living together. I would sit down with him a lot, and we'd play music together, and I would basically show him, this is what I want to do. You take it from here, add your technique, add your style, uh, add your character. And that's what he did. 
And, and the funny thing is, before we even got Jeff, and this goes for all the musicians that I had prior to Jeff, I always told them, here are three things you need to get, a delay pedal, a reverb pedal, uh, a flange pedal, um, and then anything to add to that just to make the hour sound a, a mysterious, dreamy type sound. And that influence came to me not only from bands like Sisters of Mercy and Fields of the Nephilim, but there were a couple of local bands in New Jersey that we used to play with. One of them was called uh, Mescal Rising. Mescal Rising eventually became a band called Sunshine Blind, uh, who I still know to this day. In fact, the, the singer was at my house in, 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 um, uh, in August. She came by to visit. Uh, but yeah, Sunshine Blind. In fact, Charlie, who was from Sunshine, Bl Sunshine Blind and Mescal Rising, even played in Empire Hideous for a short time. When I used to go see Mescal Rising play at the local club in Newark, I was influenced by the style that Charlie was playing in his band. The, the, the extreme amount of reverb and delay and all kinds of sounds. That is what I wanted. And that's what I told every single musician who stepped into Empire Hideous. This is the sound you've got to get. We're not going, this is not a new band where I'm working with you. You've got to play what I've written and how it sounds. So when Jeff came in, it was cake. He knew exactly what I wanted. And it just developed from that point on to this day. Obviously, I follow you on, on uh, Facebook. Um, Jeff is, uh, is still playing with you in Empire Radius, correct? Technically, you could say that, but I mean, we did a couple of gigs back in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we started with an acoustic gig in 2018. And then we began rehearsing um, for throughout the winter to play gigs that were set up for uh, for the summer of mm -hmm. uh, 2020, uh, 2019. We did, technically speaking, we did three reunion shows, if you want to call them that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we played three gigs. And then everything got shut down. And I was like, you know what? It, 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 it's just, it's my fucking luck. You know, all, all my life, all my life with my band, I have struggled. Uh, I will toot my own horn a little bit by saying Empire Hideous at some point between 90, 95 and 98 is when we blew up. I mean, we were we were selling out venues, and for an unsigned band, that's really good. Oh yeah. When when you have a guy like Peter Steele from Typo Negative approach you and say, "I would like your band to go on tour with us," I mean that that's a that's a good fucking deal for an yeah. unsigned band. Um, yeah. So you know, we went pretty far as an unsigned band, but. I always had problems. It was always something. If it wasn't a matter of a record label signing us to the, you know, to their label so that we could uh, tour professionally and put records out professionally, if it wasn't something like that, it was something like, you know, the van breaking down and it costing me twenty five hundred dollars to get a new transmission, or, um, you know, losing a drummer and then having to get a new one and then teach him the whole thing again. It was just this constant, constant, nonstop barrage of, of problems, which if you're in a band, this is what you're going to face. That's why I wrote my book, because it, it shows you everything I went through as an unsigned band without a record label, without management, without publicity, without a touring agent. I did everything on my own with the help of the musicians and occasionally uh, one or two people that would act as a manager or a publicity person. And that's how we did it. We did it all on our own, a, a, you know, DIY. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to uh, yeah, have you on. I'm obviously very influenced by a lot of 
a lot of like punk rock and uh, punk rock musicians. And for not that I would consider musically a lot of what Empire Hideous does to be like uh, like sonically, it's not exactly what what most people would would call punk rock. Um, and people argue about what is and what isn't. That's so stupid. But the whole um, the attitude and kind of I feel like your a lot of your career has been very you know, punk rock and that like fuck you I'm gonna do it myself. Right you now it's like I, uh, I that's one of the things that I've always thought was very admirable about how you've um, you know continued to uh, move throughout your career is that it's you know you you did end up at one point being you know the singer of, of one of your, your at the time favorite bands and at the time of the fairly you know notable act and then obviously you know it's it's all in the book everything um but i, I always thought it was cool how <clears throat> after all the misfits issues whatever you want to call it you uh, started another band uh ss99 i wanted to ask you Prior to SS99, did did Jerry tell you to? I feel like I remember this. Did Jerry tell you to start writing for the album? For for the album, like didn't they? They kind of led you on, led you to believe that you were going to be the permanent replacement for Graves, right. and told you to write lyrics and that gave you the, the idea that you'd be even recording with them. That is that. That's absolutely right. So uh, the band you, men- you mentioned, SS99, and for those who don't know what SS99 is, it's not some KKK Nazi band. Oh, good point. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Technically speaking, SS99 is the abbreviation of the band's name, Spy Society 99, and it was all spelled as one word, Spy Society 99. So to shorten it up, it was SS99. Um, so... We were on a plane coming back from, I want to say we were flying from, we had gone from Puerto Rico to Florida for a changeover or switchover, whatever they, whatever they call it, and then from Florida to Newark, New Jersey. And somewhere either from Puerto Rico to Florida or Florida to Newark, Jerry Literally, I, I'm sitting in the in the chair in the plane, and he literally turns around and says to him, because he was in the in the in the chair in front of me, and says to me, "Listen, start writing lyrics because when we get back, we're going to start writing music." Now, this was a very confusing statement to me at the time, mm-hmm. because that tour, though it was my best vocally, and I really did. I, I don't mean to brag, but I did really good on that tour. That was the because second I wasn't, tour. That was the second tour, uh, South America. And um, I did good on that one because I wasn't doing nine shows in a row. You know, that, that killed my voice. I wasn't used to that. In addition to singing 30 punk rock songs in one hour. 30 punk rock songs in one hour. Killed Had me. you not been really singing a lot? in the kind of in the months leading up to that as well. right i because I, because i i broke up empire hideous um uh we did our last show on february 16th 1998 so from february until may i wasn't singing that much but but i'm getting off the off the off track here mm-hmm. uh so so yeah so jerry tells me start writing lyrics and and having that tour having been so fucking shitty for me they were treating me like crap man they people weren't talking to me people were disrespecting me i mean in the fucking band i was being disrespected by my own bandmates not talking to me treating me like i was a a a child and ignoring me i was never invited to sit down in the band meetings they had i was left out so he turns and tells, tells me, start writing lyrics for, for, the, for the, you know, when we get back home, because we're going to write music. I'm like, OK, yeah, maybe that maybe this will work out. Maybe they're just a bunch of assholes that I have to deal with in order to 
stay in the band and make my own, um, get my own recognition and my own stardom and notoriety, if you will. Right. Because because I'll tell you, having worked with them in the European tour and the South American tour, I thought they were they they've treated me like shit. Yeah. I I really was. My whole view of them, or, or shall I say, my whole dream of singing for them in their band was shattered when I was treated like a jackass. So <clears throat> I just figured, you know what, Mike, shut your mouth, keep your fucking mouth shut, don't say anything, only speak when you're spoken to. And by all means, don't give any opinions because they're not going to listen to you anyway. So that's what I thought. So when he told me to write lyrics, I figured, all right, well, maybe this might be something that'll work if I just keep my mouth shut, do what they tell me, and then maybe in a year or two, I'll skip off and, and do my own thing again. Yeah. Pull Empire Hideous out of the out of the trash pan, out of trash bin and start again with that. Mm-hmm. So when that didn't happen, because after I got back, it was only what a week, I think, maybe. Maybe two weeks since I, when I got back from the, the South American tour, that Jerry literally told me I was out of the band on the phone. So when that all fell apart, the lyrics, I think this is where you're leading with the question is, the lyrics that I wrote for the Misfit songs that I wanted to do, I eventually converted to be songs for spy society 99 or ss 99 and that's when i i i formed ss 99 literally a month after getting out of empire uh out of the misfits because i had nothing when i got out of the uh the misfits i had nothing i didn't have a place to live i didn't have a job uh i didn't have a band you know i, I was literally living out of boxes <clears throat> boxes and stuff i had a store when i when i got the the gig to go on tour i had to store everything and uh you know i had nothing i had nothing so um i was living with my girlfriend at the time we had this tiny little apartment it was literally about i'd say about 15 maybe 12 feet wide by about I'm going to say 30, 30 to 40 feet long. There was one window in the entire place. And that was in the back by the, by the, um, by the bedroom. And all you saw was the roof of another building. (laughs) So it didn't even count as a window. Um, but, uh, the heating was bad. I mean, it was terrible. It was was a terrible apartment. So it was me, my girlfriend and three cats living there. And, uh, unfortunately it didn't, it didn't work out well. And, I ended up taking the studio that was available next to me, an art studio, but that's another story. Um, So, you know, I, 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 I come out, I've got nothing, but I started that band. Excuse me again. It's just Gatorade. Uh, uh, As soon as I got out, I started SS 99. And in two months, I think we played our first gig. Yeah. I, I, I noticed looking from the timeline, it was, very very quickly and i guess it makes sense because you were saying you got you come home from the tour going from living the rock star life to coming home and having nothing at all so i guess to the effort to retain sanity just started throw yourself into the new band with spy society 99 um i thought it was interesting that uh even after going through everything you'd gone through uh, with your time in the misfits that um y'all ended up doing a cover of horror business that band actually still ended up covering some is it is that the only misfits tune you guys ended up doing yeah yeah Yeah. and and if i may stop you there the only reason we did it was because i would always have some heckler in the audience when, when spy society would play there was always some heckler in the audience going do a misfit song do a misfit song of course so you know i i figured out you know you wanna you wanna fuck around okay fine so we did this uh this lounge version of horror business mm-hmm. and 
when we would start the song, I would throw in like a little, um, what do they call it? Um, a montage. Is that it? When you, when you add a couple of different songs to one song? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, but believe so. Like, uh, all right. So, all right. So yeah, we did this yeah. little, if that's the right word, this little montage at the beginning where, uh, we'd start playing the, the riff to horror business and I would start singing like, die, 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 my darling, 20 eyes in my head. And, you know, I just did this little skit of like a couple of different lyrics from the other songs in the beginning. And then we went right into horror business. And not, not to brag, but I got to tell you this because I'm very proud of it. When I sent the song to Glenn Danzig and spoke to him on the phone after he received it, he actually told me, he's like, Mike, this is one of the best versions i've ever heard of a misfit song so that was to me that was really really very very enlightening yeah. as a matter of fact and, and not to get off the subject but there was another time where i actually met you know who steve zing is right yes okay for those of you who don't know steve zing was in sam hain with glenn danzig he played drums and eventually uh, he's now in danzig's band uh, I think he plays bass. Yeah, sometimes he'll switch if they got a uh, somebody else that's gonna play bass. He'll play play drums if they do a Sam Hain show or something. Anywho, mm-hmm. I saw Steve one night. Steve and I go back to the '80s, uh, and I saw him in a bar one night. It's a place in Passaic, New Jersey, and I walked up to him and I'm like, "Hey, Steve, how you doing? We're talking," and he says to me, "You know." Again, I, I hate to sound like I'm bragging, but I'm very proud of this. He says to me, you know, he goes, uh, I was talking to Glenn the other day, and him and I were watching some of the, the YouTube videos of you singing for the Misfits. And he said, Glenn said to me, you were the fucking guy. He's like, you blew graves away. That's what Glenn said to me about me to Steve. Oh, shit. And yeah, I was so honored. You know, yeah. when when I heard that, that was a my head just went woo. You know, um, yeah, of course. I was you know because you know Glenn Danzig was a huge inspiration to me, an yeah. influence to me. So to have him tell me not only that my version of horror business was great to him, but to also hear him say that I was aside from himself, right, the better the better part of the new Misfits to come out. That was a, a huge thing for me. Yeah, I mean that's that's like you know the getting the, the seal of approval from you know the guy that that started and himself exactly exactly. So, yeah. but anyway, I I ended up using I think we're gonna go back to the original question, which was uh, the lyrics that I wrote, right. um, that I had written for the Misfits. I I made them so that they were, um. How, how would I say this? I, I converted them to become SS99 songs. Mm-hmm. I polished them. And tweaked them to make them and fit more them, right. the themes. That, Absolutely. That I, I don't like to brag, but if you compare, all right, if you compare my music with SS99, even Empire of Hideous, but let's say SS99 for now. Mm-hmm. If you compare that band with the misfits there's no comparison musically musically i outrank them I my and and i, I I'm, I'm sorry i I don't, I don't mean to put put you know anyone who's listening who likes the misfits or sam hain or whatever that's fine i love the misfits before the new misfits came out in 95 that version i don't like anything prior to that i love because it was punk rock however when you listen to SS99, there's nothing punk rock about it. The songs are written and done with musicians who knew what they were doing. The guitar player and the bass player that I had were phenomenal. Now you compare that you compare that to Jerry and Doyle's playing. I'm sorry, but there's no there's no comparison. I like to an extent, what Doyle does, even though it's not, but it's nothing special. Um, and Jerry, forget it. Um, Jerry, Jerry, when Jerry switched from a pick to using his fingers on the, mm-hmm. like he just, it, it, all it is is muffled 
jumbled crap. Well, he's got it so dirty, too. His base is like garbage. Like, you can't make out anything that they're playing. You can't. Yeah. And the same thing, even with, with, with Doyle, it's so, and like, I like, I like high gain guitars. Like I've got, I've got a fucking DOD grunge pedal over here on the floor. So like, I like obnoxious distortion, <clears throat> but the whole, like, the whole thing is just punches the fucking guitar, you know? And like, you know why, you know why that is? Because their guitars are handmade. They look fucking badass. They're cool. They are. But cool. there's, and, and, and <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> there was an interview we did and they and Jerry talks about how they make their own guitars mm-hmm. and there's no volume buttons on them. There's no nothing to control treble or bass, nothing to control volume, uh, no high end, no low end, no switching of amps. It's just plug it in. You know, that that's what you get with a Misfits guitar. They look great. Don't get me wrong, but their guitars and their bass are not i should say jerry's bass and doyle's guitar they are not like a fender they're not like a gibson they're not like a a, uh an ibanez those guitars are made professionally and they sound good but you take now you take the combination of jerry's bass guitar with no volume uh plugged into an amp with total distortion on it a guy who's playing a bass with fingers and not a pick. Sloppily. And you have, and exactly, and now you have a soup of crap. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's what it is. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I never did, and I still don't, and I never will, like the new version of The Misfits. I just don't like it. Jerry is not the songwriter that Glenn Danzig is is and was at the time God, no. <laughs> right so 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 the early misfits stuff i love it i love all the early stuff because glenn was a songwriter i'm right. sorry to say i'm sorry to say jerry is not um um he's not I, you know I, I i have a lot of respect for the guy in the fact that he start he was part of a worldwide cult trend Uh, trends a bad word trends a bad word cult historical cult of misfit lovers uh it's one of the only bands in the world in which uh you know you could buy 45 for like three thousand dollars uh it's one of the only bands in the world that started uh a hairstyle i mean aside from punk rock with the with the mohawk it was jerry only who started the devil lock yeah um, and it was Glenn, you know, their look, the whole, that, that black, the big black, but like almost like Nazis looking with the, with the black, yeah. um, very Nazi looking with the big black boots. I mean, I even, I still own my pair. I pulled mine in 1985. I still have my boots from 1985, wore them on tour. In fact, um, but you know, the, the long sweatbands with the cut off black leather gloves, uh, the um, arm bands, you're right. The arm bands, I right. how like like vaguely nazi reminiscent some of absolutely that was and Holy it's shit. it's not it's not because they were like a, a racist band no I, i'll say this please try to understand when i say this but the nazis had cool fucking uniforms <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm sorry to say i, I mean it was very what, intimidating it, it was, was intimidating they, they, but they, they they had a certain designer who designed their outfits and they looked badass. I'm sorry to say the Nazis looked really cool. <laughs> it's a horrible <laughs> thing what they did, but their, their look was like prestigious. Yeah. The, the, the look was very intimidating, you know, kind of a, on a purely aesthetic level. It, uh, it, it, it served its purpose. It did what it was supposed to do. Um, but, and yeah, you can't like, that's when that one, I, I don't think, I think obviously Jerry's a, a, a sh- not a good bass player. I don't like his tone. He's definitely not the songwriter that that Glenn is. Like you're, I would 100% agree with that. But he he is responsible, at least partially responsible for uh, you know the band's very fame. iconic aspects of the band. That's exactly right. like I, the band wouldn't be what they are if it weren't for 
kind of, I guess, his tenacity. Um, you know, even Doyle, even point. Doyle, like Doyle comes into the band purely because of the fact that it's Jerry's brother. They kicked Bobby Steele out, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard the story, but Bobby Steele shows up. They got a, a gig set up at the Ritz in New York City. Bobby Steele shows up with Frank fucking Zappa to see the show. Mm-hmm. And Kenny, Kenny, uh, who was uh, Jerry and Doyle's brother, who acted as their manager for a while. Kenny was at all the shows before they were huge and famous. But here's Kenny. Opens the door at the dressing room and Bobby's there with fucking Frank Zappa. And, and he tells Bobby, sorry, man, but you're not in the band anymore. They kicked you out. How fucked up is that? They and they, Kenny they tell Bobby that. Yeah. And they and Jerry ends up bringing um, bringing Doyle into the picture. Now, Doyle was all I think Doyle was 16 when he got in the band. Oh, OK. Now, you know, they're young. They look badass. I'll be the first to admit it. They look fucking badass. The hair, the muscles and just cool punk band. Yeah. But they they lost all that. They lost all that. When I met Jerry and Doyle in 1980, I think it was 85, maybe 86, they, they lost it. They, they weren't punk rockers like they were back in the day. No, I, I get, I understand totally what, what you mean with that. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it did, that leads into uh, another topic, I guess, or something else I wanted to ask you about. I, I remembered a little bit of that because um, there was a, a documentary, I guess, a little over 10 years ago now, that that's actually some, some one of the things I wanted to ask you about. It, it seemed like there, it was, I had seen the trailer and parts of it on YouTube for the documentary Living the American Nightmare. Um, and it's uh, for anybody that wants to see it. It's, it is still available on your website, correct? I have one. Yeah, and no, I have one copy left on Dead. DVD, and then it's gone forever. So anybody that wants that last one, I'll of course have a link to your website in the description of the video once this goes up. Um, but I had, had picked up a copy of you, it from your website, I believe. Do I you have about, a copy? I do. I had uh, I had bought it from your website I think about two a couple of years ago. Um, and I thought it was, it was really interesting. Um, I think, I thought it was a little bit strange how it was edited because it's like half, it feels like half the movie is about you. And then the other half is kind of about touring. Um, mm-hmm. I know that the, and again, I'm not trying to get you to talk shit on anybody. Um, but I know the, I don't, I, I, I uh, shudder to say necessarily the filmmaker, cause I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like you had more to do with the direction of the film maybe not the editing, but the direction of the film, then the fellow Paul Bazile, um, he's got some questionable content on the internet now. Um, but that's, that's another story. He does a lot of that proud boy shit, which I don't get behind. Um, but I thought it was, uh, I, I thought it was strange how it was kind of like, you know, advertise, or at least it seemed like he advertised it a little bit. Um, and then a little bit, <laughs> A little bit. He made a lot of money off that that DVD, and really? I didn't make a I didn't make a fucking dime. That film, <laughs> it says right in the beginning beginning of the film, it says influenced from the book or influenced by the book King of an Empire to the Shoes of a Misfit. That's what this that movie was supposed to be based on. He came to me. Now you read the book. Yes. Right. You read my book. So yes, there's sir. a in, in, in chapter 11, the last chapter is where I explained everything that happened. I have no reason to lie about it. Um, and it's sad what happened because I actually liked Paul. I liked him a lot. I really did. And yeah. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to let you get to your question. But. I was willing these past couple of years, I was willing to uh, to make up and, and be friends with him again because that's how much I like Paul. 
um, but he won't talk to me. And uh, I mean, he, he, he took a lot of money. He took a lot of money. And uh, everybody on the crew, we had like 14 people on a, on a crew. Yeah. Editors, sound men, cameramen. Um, oh, my God. Everybody was like, we had so many people on the crew. Nobody got a dime. He sold all those DVDs, posters, stickers, guitar picks, uh, T-shirts, most of them bearing my face. And a DVD that he refused to work with me on. And he literally stole it. And he made a lot of money on it. And, and, and it, it really pissed me off because it was my idea. And he took it. All I can tell anybody who may be unable to make a choice on what they believe, if you really want to know the story, get the book, read the 11th chapter. It'll tell you exactly what happened. I have no reason to lie. And I'm going to say it again. I was willing. I still am willing. To make amends with Paul. And, and 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 we had we had a serious and when we still do we have a serious bout between each other, but I'm willing to let bygones be got bygones and move forward. But you know I would have to know and and here's the hard part I'd have to know that he'd be willing to do the same thing because yeah. technically he lied to me, and uh, that's all I'm going to say. I liked it a lot, but I. I my problem with I, I want to know who edited it because it's the I thought I mean and I thought it was cool the parts about touring um, you know were interesting but I wish that the narrative would have focused more on being an adaptation of this because right. that was that's where the story was to me that's right um, and that that's what I was that's what I bought it for I wanted to you know right. I wanted to you know, hear it from the people involved. So when it starts bouncing, and it's cool to, it's cool to hear, you know, like, um, you know, like, uh, like Jason Triox and talk about, you know, not getting, not making money on tour and, you know, but doing it anyway. And, and then talking about, you know, how he's having to check in to a rehab, you know, he playing a sold out show on Friday and then checking into a, a detox center on, on Saturday. And I knew a lot of touring musicians that got really, really fucked up. Um, not to be too all over the place, but just to to kind of segue. One of the most heartbreaking things I thought in in the movie and in the book, um, and one of the things that I sadly related to a lot was the when it touched on the period of addiction that video where I believe correct me if I'm wrong you had you had made that video uh, in case you had died right you're talking about the scene where I'm I'm about to inject heroin into my veins yes so that's in the film uh, living the American nightmare that footage uh, it all started from me showing Paul the editor uh, this footage that I had recorded of when I was dealing with my own drug addiction, heroin. And um, I videotaped the process of me doing it and explained, like, all you see is a a segment in the film. Mm -hmm. But the actual video that I shot is probably about an hour long. And it explains why, well, after I did it, (laughs) after I did it, about 10 minutes later, I actually nodded out. Um, so when I get back up, I start explaining the whole thing of why I'm doing it, uh, how I got to this point, why, how I want to, I want to stop doing it. Cause I know it's bad and I can't afford it. I knew, I knew I had to get off of it, but only a handful of people knew that I was taking drugs, um, particularly in that method and the stuff that I was taking. So, uh, I I, I did that film, that video, I should say. I did that video because I thought maybe I might die. 
And um, at that point, I had already been off of drugs, let's see, 2007, 8, 9, 10, about three years, three or four years. And uh, yeah, I mean, so he put it in. At first, I, I, I didn't want him to. Right. Uh, even after I gave it to him, I, then I thought, oh, maybe this is a bad idea. <clears throat> and then he convinced me to keep it in. Um, and you know, like my family ended up seeing it when we had, when we had the debut of uh, the debut of the film, mm-hmm. uh, living, living the American Nightmare. But at that point, you know, I said, it is what it is. It was part of my life. I got through it. It's history. Accept me for who I am. If you don't like it, well, then fuck you. But uh, yeah. I think, yeah, that was pretty much where I went with that. As far as what you were saying about the editing, <clears throat> the editing of the film was done by two people. Uh, one guy was uh, Paul. Uh, and when he wasn't editing, the guy, Jason Ellinger, who was, uh, he was kind of the chief we had. Uh, it was me and Paul and then Jason. Uh, Jason Ellinger came up and he was the guy who had gotten the whole crew together. Okay, I think he was a, he was involved in like some kind of university or college. I don't know. But he got all the people together and we formed a whole company, really. Uh, so the editing became shit when when Paul started adding footage. And I hate to say the word, but nobody's um no people that had nothing to do with my life right people that he was simply doing a favor for oh i'll put you in the film you know like and i i would question him all the time like why are you putting these people in the film yeah they they have nothing like there was one kid who gave his opinion and critique of the misfits mind you this kid wasn't even born when the misfits broke up. So right. here's this young 18 year old kid talking about a band that the original lineup broke up like 10 years before he was even born. If maybe more, 20 years before he was born. Right. And I'm like, what, what, why this, would you do this? This kid has to say, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's not that I don't like the kid, but I'm making a movie here, and the movie's supposed to be about my life. That that movie was supposed to be about how I got from the beginning of Empire Hideous to the Misfits, to Spy Society, the Bronx Casket Company, back to Empire Hideous, and then my swan song. That was the purpose of the film. Paul came to me, sat at my kitchen table, and said, I quote, I want to do your film. You will have complete control. You will have the final say, the final cut, the final edit. What you want, you will get, unquote. And at the end, he completely fucked me. And he he turned the film into what he wanted. And I got very angry with that. I even offered him. I said, look, we're going to do two DVDs in one DVD holder case. Mm -hmm. The director's cut, which is your two hours and 10 minute talking head video. And we're going to do my version, which is only going to be about an hour and 20 minutes. Watching two hours and 10 minutes of people just talking tends to get a little boring. So Jason Ellinger, he did a version. He cut all the nonsense out did a shorter version. It was going to be called the hideous, the hideous files or something like that. And Paul rejected. It. I'm like, Paul, what are you rejecting? There's nothing to reject. You're getting your film. Yeah. But we're going to do our film as well. The film that was supposed to be about me and my history in music. Right. And that's what we're going to do. We had so many, so much ability to release special editions special features including long interview like full interviews with peter Steele, the last interview he did before he died but, full yeah. interviews with bobby Steele that weren't added into the film full interviews of like I, oh i don't know all these other people that we couldn't 
put all the footage in because it was right. too long. Yeah. But Paul wouldn't have it. So That's... it was just a shame. A film that could have been eventually could have been seen on Netflix mm-hmm. at this point. But now, no, because and if I ever see it on Netflix, there's going to be a huge lawsuit because that film still to this day technically belongs 50 percent to me. And I've got all the paperwork in it that states so. So at this point, once the DVDs are sold, that video is really never supposed to be sold again, because if so, it would only show that Paul's making money off of me. Again. Again. I'm talking like tens of thousands of dollars. Damn. That's. You know, I got to when I looked up a little bit more about. This Paul Bazile fella, and again, I'm not going to here to trash anybody. I didn't find very many good things. Um, not a lot. Not a lot that spoke well about the fella's character. So, which you know isn't isn't a surprise after you know I, I'm not I'm not hearing anything else to change my to, to change my opinion of him. I have nothing good to say about it. I, I don't I don't agree with whatever his politics are, and I, I think it's really shitty that he did that to you. And it, it's it's a, it's frustrating to watch that that film because it had the potential to be, in my opinion, it could have been one of the more entertaining, you know, like kind of rock documentaries that I've seen in probably like the last like ten or so years. And it would have been great to see a more concise edit, like you had mentioned, where you, they cut out the bullshit. One of the, I think one of the 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 two really interesting uh, interviews which you mentioned. Um, Peter Steele's you know, last interview he ever gave, he was really funny in, in the segment that, that he did, and, he and Bobby Steele as well. That was actually another kind of segueing into that. And you had, I think it, if I'm remembering right, you had met Peter Steele through um, a, a journalism gig that you had had, correct? Yes. Uh, I met him, the first time I met him was at the Limelight in New York City, where um, I had spoken to the manager earlier, that the, a couple weeks earlier, and set up uh, you know, to, to get on the, 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 um, the VIP list at the club so I could come see the show and do a review. In fact, Peter was, they were off tour as typo negative. Peter was doing a reunion show of Carnivore. Uh, And I had seen Carnivore, oh, my God, as far back as 1986, 85. Oh, my God, yeah, back in Dover, New Jersey, at a place called The Show Place, uh, which is now a strip club. Um, But I saw, like, I saw Suicidal Tendencies. I saw Dead Kennedys, uh, Black Flag, um, Slayer, and Carnivore. Anyway, so um, I spoke to the manager, Ken. He put me on the list for the show. I go to the show. Before they started, I went up to the green room, dressing room. Um, I used to do that all the time, just to walk right into the dressing rooms and, of whoever was playing. And uh, I walked up to, actually, Peter was sitting down. I walked up to him. I'm like, hey, man, you mind if I ask you a few questions before you do the show? He's like, yeah, sure. So we're talking. We hit it off really well. And I was always thinking, always pr- self-promoting. After I did the interview, I handed him an Empire Hideous CD. Nice. So let's see. That was, uh, I don't remember exactly when that was, but I know a few months later, possibly a year, we do a show. As a matter of fact, I think it was just a couple days ago, January 27th. uh, uh, Yeah, in fact, a show January 27th at a place called The Bank in New York City for an event called The Vampire's Ball. Sold out. There was like 700, 800 people there. Sold out club. And I remember I was doing my thing on stage and at the back of the club, all the way in the back, I saw this seven foot guy standing with like a police hat on and a leather jacket. I didn't know it was Peter, but I Mm. saw this guy I mean, he stood out. You couldn't miss him. He was like gigantic. So after the show, go downstairs, 
into the I'm in the dressing room and the promoter comes up to me and says, Peter Steele wants to meet you. OK, so Pete comes in. Now, I knew Pete. I'm like, hey, Pete, how you doing? I, you know, remember I met you. He's like, yeah, I know. I got your CD. I said, uh, cool. He goes, uh, listen, I would like your band to go on tour with Typo Negative. And if you want to know more about it, read the book. <laughs> yeah, you do elaborate on there in, in the book. So that is definitely what there's there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good stories in there, obviously. I do want to ask you one one more thing uh, related to uh, to uh, to Peter. And correct me if I'm wrong, because this uh, again, my um, my memory is not always the best, uh, <laughs> even though I try. Um. <laughs> Before he passed away, he was working on, was it just pre-production or Peter was working on, uh, on his production for uh, an album in, in around 2010. Is that correct? Right. So, so here's what happened. Um, when we were doing the interview of Peter Steele for the film Living the American Nightmare, uh, I hadn't seen Peter in almost 10 years at that point. So uh, before the interview had started, he said to me, so Mike, it was, uh, you know, how's the van going? What are you doing? I'm like, Peter, I'm done. I had nothing but problems from 2005 until, uh, what was that, 2010? Is that when he died? I, I think he died so. it April 10. April 2010. So was it April? I'm pretty sure it was. I think you're right. All right. So we do this interview with him a few months earlier. And uh, he says to me, you know, what are you doing? I tell him I'm, I'm sick of music. You know, every every time I try to do something, it, it just ends up getting totally fucked up. Um, and I said, I'm putting out my last record. I had, I had to deal with a record label, a record label. Uh, to put out two records and I wanted to fulfill my contract. So I had one person to work with and that was this guy named Johnny Nickel. Johnny and I, he actually played in the band as a guitarist uh, several years earlier, around 2004, three, can't remember, but we, about 2003, we knew each other the whole time. He helped me, he's a genius when it comes to engineering and recording. So he helped me start recording. Mm -hmm. And when I told Peter that I was working on my last record, he said to me, do you need any help? I said, yeah, what do you want to do? He goes, uh, you got anybody doing production on it? I'm like, Peter, I would be honored if you would produce my record. Yeah. He said, absolutely. He goes, get me the stuff and, and I'll start doing pre-production. Okay, great. So <clears throat> we do the interview. I go home, I contact Johnny. I'm like, Johnny, guess what? Peter still wants to produce our record. Terrific. So we get Peter all the demos and, and the unfinished, unmastered recordings of the, of the album that I was getting ready to release in a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, got him lyric sheets, everything, sent it to him. After he got the package, and by the way, he was living in Scranton. Oh, no shit. By the way, yeah. Uh, that, that's where he moved uh, when he was he was with a new girl getting off a of drug, so on and so forth. So. Um, he calls me about a, I don't know, a day or two after he got the package and he tells me, Mike, he says, you got this is fucking great stuff you got on here. He goes, I just want to tweak a few things. He goes, but I guarantee you when we're done, this album is going to fucking be amazing. And I was so flattered and humbled that Pete wanted to do my record. Now, mind you, he had asked me three times prior to go on tour with him, and I couldn't do it. Always something, always something got in the way. So I finally had this one last opportunity for him to produce a record for Empire Hideous, for me, essentially, because at that yeah. point I didn't even I didn't even have a band. And then he dies. In fact, 
he died. And I'm not going to say while he was working on doing the pre-production of the Empire Hideous album. But he began to get the symptoms of a heart attack. He was having trouble breathing. His, his chest felt like there was a truck on it. He's having troubles with his arm. And eventually, you know, his girlfriend came home. Pam came home. They called the ambulance. And that's the end of that. But when I did speak to Pam the next day, she told me, she's like, Mike, he was working on your stuff when all this happened. She's like, oh, uh, in fact, she said, all your stuff is still laid out here on, on the desk in front of the computer. He was working on doing pre-production for the album titled The Time Has Come. That was the last studio recording album of the Empire Hideous. And that was the album that Peter was working on when he began to get his problems with the heart attack. And in fact, there is a, a song, a cover song at the end of the album called Moving in Stereo. It's not listed on the album, but uh, it's, a, it's a cover by the Cars from their first album. And Peter and I was, had, been spoke, had been speaking, and he's, he told me, he goes, one of my favorite songs is Moving in Stereo by the Car. So we did that song because Peter asked us to do a cover, and Johnny and I said, let's do that. And he said that was his favorite song. So that song was added into the album. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it, it even states that that song is dedicated to Peter. I could be wrong. I can't remember, but I do know I dedicated I it, it to him. Because I was Mike. I was listening to that that CD. Um, um, it was it's actually in my uh, in my car stereo at the moment because uh, I remember um, in the you know email a little bit leading up to this, um, you had told me to specifically to um, to listen to that album. Uh, there's a there's a lot of songs on there that that I like, um, but it's 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 interesting or let that's the album that peter started working on eventually became the time has come is what you're that's saying right yeah. reading the lyrics for that there's a lot of um basically a lot of the songs on there are about heartbreak and magic um i i am a really uh dedicated uh devoted studier of the occult and Satanism. Um, so at that point, I was already really into it. Uh, so I started writing some songs about magic and 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 occult. But there are a lot of songs in there about heartbreak. If that's where you're going with that. Yes, and that's one of the things I really enjoyed about it is um, is this kind of balance. Um, there's a lot of themes of like I said, heartbreak, kind of love and and death and that kind of uh you know kind of classic for lack of a better term kind of goth gothic uh it has a lot of atmospheric qualities when listening to it um well, compared kind of compared to compared to all the other records i've ever done in, in my personal opinion i think the time has come is probably the best the best produced best recorded and best theme album that I've ever written. And I don't mean to boast, but that's how I feel. I think any artist who, or musician or writer who puts out records, music, they're always going to like, not always, but in a lot of cases, they'll like the last thing they did compared, they'll like the last thing they did compared to earlier stuff they did. Like, for example, I can't stand my first record. I can't stand it. It's horrible. But as I progressed over the years, as a songwriter, I became better. As a lyricist, I became better. As a vocalist, I became better. Um, but that, you know, that comes with practice and 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 uh, technique and, and and just the constant practice of it, you know. Um, so yeah, for me, the time has come was my favorite album by yeah. Empire Hades. So that's why I told you to listen to that one because that I felt is my best work. I see what you mean, and I think with that, that I feel like is the album that I would like give to somebody if somebody said like, "Hey, I've never heard Empire Hideous. What should I check out?" 
after listening to it a couple times that I felt that that is probably what the one I would hand to somebody if they said, Hey, where, where do I start? Where do I start here? And it, it's interesting because there's, you know, less, at least comparatively speaking, less fond of your earlier work, you know, compared to later works. But uh, one of the questions I did want to ask you was what is like, what is your songwriting process? <laughs> You know, so many people ask me that. <clears throat> I never had a, I never had a specific format. Um, sometimes I'll write the lyrics first. Other times I'll just write a riff on a guitar or a bass or even a keyboard. Uh, and I'll write the basic riff, you know, the basic format, the melody. And yeah. then when I when I had a band, <clears throat> I used to present them that demo and say, okay, you know add your your part to this you know um mm. and that's how i got songs written but for the last album the time has come that was all me uh i didn't have a guitar player i didn't have a bass player i didn't have a drummer all i had was johnny and johnny was going based on the demos that i had recorded on a four track at this little four track mini studio uh so even though I own a bass guitar, a guitar, a keyboard, and a drum machine, I'm not that good <laughs> at, at you know playing all of them. So again, I would write the basics. I had the demos, and then I presented them to Johnny. Uh, Johnny is a phenomenal guitar player, uh, and he, he had all the equipment to do it. He had, a, he had a small setup, but when you listen to that album, it's top notch, in my opinion top notch blows away blows away any pre uh, any record of production prior to that album so um yeah there's no format for me i i just sort of mind you i i'm more of an artist than i am a musician I, i'm a performer um and that that's always been my skill uh to get up on stage and to make a total fool out of myself um yeah that that's what I do, uh, but first and foremost, I'm an artist. Uh, you know, painting, drawing, uh, that sort of thing. So for me, music music is an extension of my art. I left the music up to the musicians to perfect. Now that is uh, another funny you use that word because. Um, that you you mentioned a bit in the book and also i think a if i remember i can't remember who said it, i think it was I think a, a band manager you had at one point had said that you uh i guess you've been called a perfectionist uh, i guess in the past by some people and uh i remember in the documentary someone says that you would be very you had expectations for people that would be in the band and you know when you as far as songwriting and rehearsing and just when it came to the band took it very seriously to the point where it had to be the way you heard it envisioned it edited it and if it wasn't that way then it it's it was kind of correct me if i'm wrong you would kind of tell people like look i wrote these songs like play it the way it's written like don't well, yeah, not I mean, people they can have no creative, no creative input, but you wanted things a very specific way most of the time, right? Well, 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 this is why. I mean, after the first incarnation of the band, all those band members were gone. It was no longer Empire hideous, hideous as a band. I mean, not to toot my own horn here, but it was Mike hideous and the Empire hideous. That's what I mean, it was my band. Anybody who came in after the first three years of, of the band, anybody who came in or four years of the band, <clears throat> they were coming into a band that already had two albums out or actually two EPs. And uh, by the time the third one came out, that would have been that was our first CD. Uh, only time will tell. So by the time that album came out, I began to have more of a set base. Mars and Eve were kind of steady. They, I knew they weren't going anywhere. Um, right. And then eventually we got, 
We got Joey, but he didn't last long. And then Raphael on drums. He, he stayed for three years. And then Jeff, of course, who stayed with me for the whole duration of the band. <clears throat> but um, you get people that come into the band and they want to change things. I'm like, you can't change things. I've already got re- records out that people are expecting to hear the song played the way it was recorded. Right. So, you know, not to stifle your creativity, but you've got to play what I've recorded. And if you can't, well, then you probably shouldn't be in a band in the first place. Um, so I think to answer your question is, uh, yeah, there was a certain stipulation that if you were going to come into the band, it was my band. It was already established. People knew who I was in, uh, nationally and internationally. So there had to, you had to work with me is what I'm saying. Um, right. And I think the person you're talking about is my friend, Dr. John. Uh, who was a former, one. yeah, former manager of the band, uh, and is it, still a good friend of mine uh, to this very day. I just saw him about two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, y- you have to. Uh, people coming into this band knew that I was a perfectionist. I wanted things done right my way, and one of the reasons it was like that is because between the first incarnation of the band and the second incarnation of the band. I had an incident in which I, uh, the second incident in which I was dealing with cancer. And it was because of my interaction with cancer that I was so motivated and inspired and focused on my project because it was something I wanted to do, an achievement that I wanted to finalize, if you will, before I died. Because I didn't know whether or not, how, or I should say how long I had left on this planet. And so I started the band after having come out of being uh, having come out of of being treated for cancer with chemotherapy and radiation therapy and tons of pills. Then I started Empire Hideous. And then after the first incarnation was gone, I went through a second bout of cancer, actually technically the third bout. Um, but the third bout was with the chemotherapy and everything. And uh, I was determined to make things, to make my imprint in the music world. So when you, you were, uh, how old were you when that, I guess when that, that uh, second, or as you said, I guess third bout with, with cancer, was that, I guess you were in your early twenties at that point? I was early 20s. I think I was 23. I think I was 23 because the first time I got it, I was 21. And then a year and a half later, I got it. I was 23. So, yeah, 23. Damn. You know, uh, obvious that something like that is just horrible at any age, but especially being a. And, and, and I got news for you. I got news for you. It didn't stop there. I've had cancer a total of. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. Shit, eight times throughout throughout your life? Since I was 16. That was the first time I, I, I had to deal with cancer. Yeah, I think um, it was mentioned briefly, at, well, not so briefly, but it mentioned in, in the Living the American Nightmare film. Um, the... I guess when you were 16, is that I think one of your friends had mentioned you had a, a tumor was it on your back? I think he had said. Was that when you were a teenager? I was That's 16. Okay, you don't want to talk about. Yeah, that. yeah. I'll, I'll keep it short so we can get on to other so, other uh, questions. But my first bout with cancer was at age 16. Uh, I was a junior in high school, and um, yeah, it started out with. Uh, in fact, you can still see it. I got this clavicle, which is enlarged. You can even still see the scar on it right yeah. here. Uh, so I go in, I was in Columbian Presbyterian in New York City, 
Um, so the clavicle was enlarged. I did a biopsy on it. While I was in the hospital, they did head to toe x-rays, CAT scans, bone scans. They didn't even have MRIs back then. So all this stuff. And while I was there, they found a tumor in my lung cavity near my heart. Uh, and they basically had to deflate the lung. And they, they cut me open from my, my nipple all the way back to my scapula. I had like 38 or 48 uh, staples in my in my side. <clears throat> and they took out a, a tumor. They took out a tumor that was about, about that big. Jesus Christ. And then, as I said, there, there were multiple uh, incidences in which I had cancer again and again and again. And the last time I had it was in uh, 16. 2016. 2016. Damn. 17, 17, sorry, 17. Holy fuck. So that's, that's what, only five, five, six years ago? Damn. Yeah, five years ago. That's really, it's, it's incredible, all the kind of sh- shit that you've been through. Um, yeah. And that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about, kind of, kind of ties into it. Can you tell me a little bit about songs like, to thread a needle song about I, I wrote right after I got out of the hospital um, uh, to thread a needle is basically a song about uh, the uh, the thought knowing that I had cancer the thought of whether or not I was going to die um, to thread a needle the, the song is basically about how I would get the injections of the morphine while I was in the hospital and how I would drift off into another world and hallucinate. Uh, but at the same time, going through my head were all these thoughts about, you know, you're going to die, Mike. You're going to die. Or, or I should say the possibilities of you dying are very prominent. That's what Thread and Needle is. And that was, that was when you were in your, your early 20s, right? About 23. Time, 23. 20, 23, 24, maybe. And I think if I remember, again, sometimes my memory is a little shit, but if, if I remember right, um, didn't you around the same time uh, as writing to thread a needle uh, and, and maybe tell me if this is if they're if, I feel like the themes are related, even if it's not necessarily as it's more implicit. It's not necessarily explicitly uh, Mr. Barnum. Was that written around the same time? Yes. In fact, they were written the same night. <laughs> yes. I, I wrote, yeah, that, I wrote that. two two songs were written the same night. Mr. Barnum and Thread and Needle. Um, Mr. Barnum uh, is a song about the duality of man's character. <clears throat> you could be good. You could be evil. And I sort of got the uh, I mean, it's a simple concept, you know, you're always dealing with, you know, do I freak out and, and beat my children or do I compose myself and do, excuse me, do things the right way? So, uh, and the, excuse me, and then the imagery that I used, there were two imagery, uh, two images that always kind of sort of made me think of this Mr. Barnum character. One of them was Lon Chaney. Senior, Lon Chaney Senior in the film London After Midnight, <clears throat> and then the second one, which by the way you, you can't see that film, it's gone. Uh, it, it yeah, the film has deteriorated. It, you can't see it anymore. Yeah. And the other one was um, the character Mr. Barnaby in the in the movie uh, uh, Toys and Babe, Toy, Babes in Toyland, uh, March of the Wooden Soldiers. Uh, Mr. Barnaby was the villain in the film, and I always found his image to be very sinister-like. So I kind of used him and the character of uh, Lon Chaney from London After Midnight and used them combined to create an image of what I can consider to be a Mr. Barnum character. A lot of people think it was written about Barnum and Bailey, the guy, the circus people, but it's not. Right. Yeah, it was kind of... Kind of um wanted to hear you kind of expand upon that um that uh, those earlier songs 
I thought were really um, musically really interesting, but also just the the kind of the the way the the way the stories are kind of told throughout the lyrics. I, I like the way those songs were crafted from from the songwriting aspect, and it's and it's just something that I I feel like you don't. I didn't I didn't see a lot of other artists at that at such a young age and I guess coming so close to death at a very young age I guess we'll do that to you but um but yeah I was just always amazed listening to some of those songs and reading the lyrics to some of these songs you know and then like 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 those two in particular you know being written at 23 because like I I'm I'm only 34 but like even 10 years ago I know how I was at 23 and I was not a very, uh, not the most mature of fellows. So wow, who, who is really, I mean, you're still, <laughs> you know, you're still looking to find yourself. I mean, I didn't find myself until after I was like 25 years old, you know, and that's yeah. when I really started to fall into the niche that I am today. But incidentally, there's another song that was also written on the same night. That song is called find my way out. And as a matter of fact, I just posted a video on the, the Hideous page uh, because the um, anniversary date of when we played CBGB's uh, for the first time on a Friday night with a real night instead of audition night. Uh, right. So we played we played on January 23rd, uh, 1993, I believe it was. And uh, so I, I posted the anniversary date on the Hideous Mike Facebook page. And um, there's video footage from the night we played at CB's. And in fact, you can see me playing the guitar. Um, that song, that song is indeed about my nights at the hospital. Uh, and it talks about, you know, being injected and morphine cocktails uh, and, and and the things that were going through my mind at the time, it was a very hard time for me, considering the age I was, you know, the age I was, and, and the fact that I had already been in the hospital twice before for cancer. So, you know, this was really affecting me as a young man. I I was thinking of death when I should have been thinking of like you know girls and going out. And I mean, I did, but Right. Always, always in the back of my mind was the fact that it could be your last day on earth, Mike. And, and to this day, I still, you know, if I get a cramp or a pain in my back or my neck, first thing that comes to my mind is like, oh, shit, I got a tumor, you know. Oh, man. That, that's the life that, that has I've been dealing with since I was 16. Probably more. Let me rephrase that. From 16 to 21, I was invincible. After I had my first bout of cancer, I was invincible. Nothing could kill me. But after 21 and 23, then I began to see life in a different in a different view. And a lot of people, I hate to say it, a lot of people, they take life for granted. Mm-hmm. And they, like, I was pushed by the mere fact that my life was almost taken away from me uh, on like three separate occasions. So that inspired me. It was my muse, if you will, to inspire me to focus on being a songwriter in a band and a performer. And and that's what pushed me as far as it did. I, I may not have been, you know, gotten into a signed band and I may have only played with the Misfits for a short time, which is probably a good thing. I wouldn't want to stay with that band. But what I'm saying is that it, it, it drove me. It drove me to get to the next level. And I did everything possible, everything I could. And mind you, I'd never been a musician prior to being in a band. I'd never written a song. I'd never, I didn't know how to book shows. I didn't know how to book tours. I didn't know anything. But I learned because I was determined, because I was kicked in the ass by cancer. I guess after living through, you know, beating cancer at a young age and then having it come back several times throughout throughout your life, has that 
contributed to why you are a little bit on the uh i guess on for lack of a better term on the dark side you know what i mean um <laughs> of course and, it did um, yeah I, I, how could it not of course it did in, in in addition to having also grown up in a roman catholic family uh That'll be. you know I, i'm i'm still working out my issues from you know growing up as a, as a a church going Catholic. Uh, right. My father, who just died in April, um, right. he was to me a wonderful, wonderful man with a heart of gold. Do you know that man made a vow to God when I was 16 years old and I was in the hospital? He made a vow to God that he would go to church every single day if god would just save my life and i kid you not from when i was 16 up until about just maybe two years ago that man went to church every single day for however long that time period was i guess what about 40 years close i'm 56 now so about 40 years or so Every day he went to church. Now, what I'm here's what I'm getting at. He was a devout Catholic. I wasn't. He never pushed it on me, but he believed in God. Mm-hmm. And he made a commitment that was for me. He went to church for me. Now, I'm not saying anything negative or positive about it. All I'm saying is that that was his belief. I don't believe I I don't see things that way religiously. Uh, I, I right after age thirteen, I immediately started not rebelling, but stepping away from Catholicism and religion because I, I had a hard time believing it. Yeah. Now now I I am a, a self self proclaimed Satanist, and by that. Uh, let me be specific. I am not. Uh, I don't drink blood. I don't sacrifice animals. I don't. Uh, you know, no human sacrifice. Not, none of that shit. Right. Modern Satanism is a method of living in which you take total responsibility for your own actions. Uh, and it, there are other things too. But I've been studying Satanism as well as the occult since. 2006 or seven, I can't remember, about 2006. And I began to read and read and read and read and read. Uh, And I I eventually found that my way of life and the way I live and the way I think is a satanic way of thinking. And, uh, you know, religious people out there can say whatever they want, you know, oh, well, you know, you're going to go to hell. So what? You know what? I, I don't care <laughs> because it's not what I believe. If that's what you're taught to believe, well, then that's what you're taught to believe. And let's face it, if it wasn't for the devil and Satanists, or I should say, if it wasn't for the devil and hell, there would be no religion. Right. Satan has kept Satan has kept the church in business for 2,000 years. That's a really good way. Good point, good way of looking at it. I'm glad you gave that explanation because there's, I feel like there's far too many people that hear Satanist uh, or Satanism and kind of like, so they automatically think that you're sacrificing animals and drinking blood and burning crosses and it's yeah because that's what they're brought up to, to believe that's what they're they're taught to believe and I'm, I'm glad that you gave the explanation because as you were saying like that's not at all what modern satanism is about well um, it depends on who you talk to because some people who aren't educated right. on it if they're not educated on it properly, they will believe that. There are people who believe that there is a hell. There are people who believe that by cutting the throat of a pigeon or a cat and, and spilling its blood and drinking it, that is proper. And no, it's not. In fact, one of the first few things in the Satanic Bible is never hurt a child, never hurt an animal. 
Right. Yeah. And the you know you really have to read between the lines of the Satanic Bible. There's so much more out there than Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible. But that's right. a whole other subject. I got to uh, I, uh, I do the other radio show. Right. And uh, I just want to thank you again uh, for taking of course. the time to talk. My to pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. Especially I appreciate you giving me, you know, it's been, I know it's been nearly two hours. So I really appreciate you taking the time. And, of course. And, you know, you, you know, just being being as cool oh, and as personal as you've been. Um, thank you. I'm 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 flattered and honored that you have me. Thank you. Thank you, and of course, you're very welcome. Um, I did want to ask you a couple other things while I've got yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, let's um, do it. What would you say if you have a proudest moment, either musically or otherwise? What would you say? What would you call like your crown jewel Uh-oh. of your career? Let's say. As a musician, as a yes. as a performer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, to be more specific, well, yes, as a musician. <clears throat> I would have to say, being in the Misfits was one of the greatest experiences I ever had. Aside from the fact that I had so many bad experiences with the band members, um, <laughs> aside from that, it was an amazing experience. Within five months, five months, yeah, five months, I I sang to about a hundred thousand people. Um, which is great. I also uh, played at the time. I played the biggest shows the Misfits had ever played up until that point. So there's my bird. Yeah, that's funny. I think I, um, I think Kenny, uh, the I forget how to pronounce the last name, Kyle. But I guess Kyle. You mentioned it. Thank you. Now now I've got clarification. Um, I think he mentioned that in in the documentary, the Living the American Nightmare documentary, that at up to that point, the biggest shows the Misfits had ever played were, were when you were the singer, yep. um, which I, I think is it's pretty freaking cool. Another thing that um, I thought was was interesting reading the book is that at one point, and obviously things would change as as you know time goes by. But when you initially replaced Michael Graves at that time, uh, something you said that I thought was um, very mature, especially given that, that, uh, your age at the time. But so you actually said, like, you actually kind of sympathized with him and kind of almost oh. felt bad for him when you initially joined the band and when he was, because he was, of course, butthurt when he found out. Um, there's the there's the, uh, the, the very interesting story in the book where he, where he talked about where he, he calls up and said, you know, fuck you guys and fuck Mike hideous. <laughs> hey, I can't blame him. He was pissed. Uh, but when I got out of the band, I did everything I possibly could to try to connect with him because I really wanted to sit down and talk to him and say, look, man, don't take it personal. You know who you're dealing with, with these guys. And I learned the hard way. Uh, mm-hmm. I knew, I knew them for 11 years prior and Jerry had screwed, kind of screwed me over prior to me being in the band. So yeah. when I joined the band, like even like Jason Trioxin and my drummer, Ralph, uh, they told me they're like, or asked me, like, aren't you afraid they're going to fuck you over again? I'm like, nah, they wouldn't do that. Nah, I'm, I'm saving their ass. I'm saving two tours for them. I'm saving them not canceling their tours and being able to sing. I can do this. Why would they fuck me over? So here's the point. I tried my damnedest to contact Michael Graves. And do you know that little rat blew smoke up my ass for what was it, 11 years? More than that. Really? From 98 to 2010. So yeah, 12 years. He blew sh- smoke up my ass because we were going to have him in the film. I, I specifically said... I specifically asked Michael. I sent him emails. I sent him text messages. I called him on the phone, left messages for him. I'm like, Michael, give me a call. I want you to be in our film. And by that time, he was already out of the Misfits for years at that point. Yeah. So um, I offer him this opportunity. Never called me back. Never replied to my emails. Never replied to my text messages. And and just kept and every time I'd bump into him somewhere, 
oh man, I've been really busy. You know, we did a gig once together, like this, an acoustic show at a club in, in, in Clifton, New Jersey. And I bump into him like, hey man, come on, you gotta, you should, you know, get in touch with me. Right. And he didn't. And uh, at that point, then he, and, and then one night, Paul saw him one night at the club and he totally like told Paul off. He's like, oh, you guys are fucking bothering me. Leave me alone. Like, hey, fine. Fuck you. We gave you an opportunity to, to be in the film, tell your side of the story, sit down next to me so that we can talk about our time working with those guys. And yeah. you're going to tell me, fuck off. So fuck you, man. Yeah, really. I, I, you know, he, he's whatever. I, I don't, I don't really give a damn anymore about it I, i'm over it i don't yeah. care you know i i don't i i will not speak to him because i have nothing to say for 12 right. years he, for 12 years he made it seem like there was no static between us until one night on the radio show that he was doing with a friend of his he tore me up and 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 just completely disrespected me and i was like you know what fuck you i don't you know all that time you couldn't come to me as a man and say hey mike I got a problem. Let's work it out. I would have been happy to discuss it with him because I did nothing to him. I did nothing to Michael to upset him. It was the band who screwed him over, not me. And I did everything I could to reconcile a circumstance that I didn't even know. I didn't even know about. But he made it clear that night on the radio show that he had a problem with me. And I was like, all right, well, then fuck you. You, know, really? you don't want to come forward and deal with it like a man, then I don't need you in my life. And that's the end of that. Yeah, I, I kind of, I'm not surprised. The, the the more I hear about Graves' character, the the, the less I'm I, I'm surprised. And he's, uh, well, we we know what he's doing. And I think the, I think the talent speaks for itself. I think when you listen to the work that you've done, I think you're leaps and bounds above him as a singer. And definitely as a uh, as a songwriter, I think. Look at his Thanks. lyrics for years. It's, it's no contest. But um, since we got about five minutes, um, is there is there any either tour story or is there any any tales or anything from your time in the Misfits that you maybe have not told, maybe never mentioned or never told anybody? <laughs> and I know that's kind of a difficult one to to answer. So that's that's kind of, that's a big question. Um, I, I should write a book one day just about all the things that I couldn't write about. Um, there were <laughs> there's a lot of things that happened on tour. Everything that they tell you about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it, it that that's it right there. It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Everything that you could possibly imagine uh, to the phrase defining rock music or rock bands about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's all 100% true. And I experienced every one of them. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I guess the, <laughs> um, the to, to get to, to wrapping it up, I guess, um, is there, yeah, I should have asked you about the, uh, the, your mockumentary to build an empire, but maybe I'll ask you about that another time. Um, in, a nut, in a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, To Build an Empire was a film, was the first documentary film that my friend Mark Steiner and I did. Mark, Mark actually, he was, it was his project. He came to me and we talked about it. And then actually he, he came to me and said, if you ever want a video done, contact me. Mm -hmm. A couple years later, I contacted him. I said, hey, listen, are you still interested? I have an idea. And I had just seen the movie by Perry Farrell uh, from Jane's Addiction. He did a movie called Gift. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my inspirations. And Glenn Danzig did a um, one of those uh, music video slash interview uh, videotapes. And that was another one of my inspirations to do to build an empire, which is no longer available, un unfortunately. But it, it was quite comical back then. Yeah, it was, I guess there's no uh, no chance of that ever popping up digitally. I don't know. Mark said he would do it someday, but I don't know. Uh, I guess last question for you. Um, are there any future plans for uh, for Empire Hideous? Any other maybe recordings, possible uh, live shows, anything, anything you do, do you have planned for the future? Of somehow I doubt somehow I doubt there'll ever be a live show again unless we do something acoustic. 
ever since this whole China virus hit, I think the whole world is broken. Um, uh, I, so many clubs, venues, theaters closed down. Uh, New York is not the same place it was before China virus. And um, so I don't think there'll ever be a live show again unless we do a small acoustic gig. Uh, and as far as recording, I am just so unmotivated. I'm so uninspired for the last two years since 2020, three years now, uh, since, yeah. well, technically two years. When, when the virus hit, it just set the whole world back. And, and I'll tell you the truth. Um, I, I really, uh, I don't, I, I'm just not happy. I'm not happy. So when I'm not happy, I can't be influenced. Jeff has written a whole bunch of songs that he sent to me. I haven't been able to do anything with them. I'm just not inspired. I'm not. I can't even do a fucking painting. I just have no inspiration. Everything just sucks right now. The country is under 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 shit administration. Uh, they're they're bringing the the entire country down. I mean, what's to be happy about? Fucking gas prices are going to go up. They're going to fucking skyrocket. I think they went up like almost a right. dollar in the past week. Uh, inflation is right ra- raising. You got hostile countries provoking us. I mean, what's what? What am I going to? Who's going to come see a band? Who gives a fuck? We're on, we're doomed. We're fucking doomed. You know, like what 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 is the purpose anymore? How can I be inspired to do music when the world is falling apart? Now nah, I, I I don't know. It's it's yet to be seen whether or not I'll I'll even consider doing something and on that note we got one minute left so i guess never say never but there's nothing in the works as far as uh never say never never say never but who knows (laughs) well i won't keep you too much longer i want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to me um it was really uh you know an honor to get to sit down and and speak with you um you know, you're a musician that i've uh you know respected and, and looked up to for a number of Thank years you. so Thank i you. uh i really appreciate you taking the time to uh to chat with me tonight my pleasure greg thank you very much uh maybe we'll do it again sometime i would love to i'd love to have you on again and uh there's hopefully more uh more questions i can get you jaw flapping about Right on. I will. Uh, I gotta. I gotta get the uh, the order though. I'll send your kid a hat. When I, like kind of like what you're wearing right now. I don't even know what they're called. A beanie hat. Yeah, beanie. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I got. I got one that uh, has the uh, Empire Hideous logo embroidered on it. I'll send nice. one for for your kid. Yeah, for Olive. Uh, Olive. Oliver. I was gonna say Olive. <laughs> <laughs> he'd love that. He'd be. He'd, I'm he'd sure be he would. Um, That's awesome. So, uh, what else was I gonna say? Um. On that note, listen. Uh, if anybody's interested, if you don't mind me saying, um, if you want to get yeah, the, if you want to get the book, King of an Empire to the Shoes of a Misfit, go to uh, MikeHideous.com, um, M-Y-K-E Hideous.com. There you go. And uh, Greg will tell you. I think he had a good time reading it. Um, yes. And that's the only place you can get it. You can't get it on Amazon or anywhere else, but. MikeHideous.com. And if you want to connect with me on social media, it's uh, Facebook.com slash Hideous Mike. That's it. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate your having me on. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure talking with you, and I hope to do it again soon. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. All right, bro? All right, man. You have a great evening. You too. Keep in touch. Bye, everybody. Will do. Have a good one, Mike. Good night. Good night.